Governor's Proclamation 2028 due to COVID. This meeting is recorded. And will the clerk please call roll? Council Member Kim Daughtry. I'm here, thank you. Council Member Joe Marine. I am here. Thank you. Council Member Jared Mead. Council Member Tom Merrill. Here. Thank you. Mayor John Nearing. Here, thank you. Thank you. Labor Representative Lance, we heard you earlier. Lance Norton. Yes, I'm here, thank you. Thank you. Council Member Sid Roberts. Here. Thank you. Council Member Jan Schwedy. I hear she's logging in at the moment. Uh, we have an excused absence from Mayor Nicholas Smith and an excused absence from Council Member Stephanie Wright. And there is Council Member Schwedy. Welcome. <laughs> Let's see here. Alternates. Uh, looks like we have. Did we oh, Council Member um, Johnson? We have you on the line. Yes. Thank yes. You. And I believe that uh, is everyone from the alternate group. Uh, Chair, we do have a quorum today. That concludes roll. Thank you. Appreciate that. Oh, so let's open it up to public comments. I see there's lots of people in here. <laughs> Maybe not. Um, there's no written comments received so far. Nobody spoke, uh, signed up in advance to speak. So I would like to open it up to anybody who would like to make a public comment. We ask that you use the raise hand feature under the participants button to indicate you would like to be to comment to the board. And if you have joined by phone, press star nine to raise your hand. Chair, it does not appear we have anyone raising their hand. Nope, I don't see anybody either. So I will close the public comment portion. Kim, I think you're muted. Okay, you're right, I'll start over. No, <laughs> um, we'll close the public comment section. Nobody raised their hand. So I will uh, now turn it over to Mr. Eagle Fritz. Uh, I thought that's what you said, but I, I'm, I haven't honed my lip reading technique just yet. So great. Well, welcome uh, to the workshop, members of the board. It's great to see you all. Uh, I've just got a couple of quick items, uh, agency items uh, for uh, update, and then we'll move into our agenda for the workshop itself. I wanted to let the board know uh, basically three things. Uh, I think you may be aware of, but I wanna remind you or, or refresh your recollection either way. Um, first is premium pay. Uh, you're aware we've been providing premium pay since the fall uh, spikes in COVID cases. Um, I've made a decision to extend the premium pay for two more weeks uh, through the pay period that ends uh, at the end of this month. And then I plan to bring premium pay to a close at that time. Um, my decision on that is based in part uh, due to the availability of vaccines uh, and the expanded uh, eligibility this week uh, for all employees and all adults uh, and the progress we're making in terms of vaccinations amongst our employees. Um, Based on public health guidance, obviously, our, our health and safety measures remain in place, will remain in place. Uh, we need to remain vigilant uh, at work and at home and, of course, uh, on board uh, to continue to pr protect ourselves. Uh, we are not out of this thing yet, but the, the trends are in the right direction. And we're at a point here where we can start to be hopeful and optimistic about uh, a brighter future. So. That is my plan as things stand right now. It, it would require a, a pretty significant reversal or unexpected circumstances to, to, to um, re reconsider that at this point. I just wanted to make sure the board knew that's where we are headed. Uh, I wanna thank Cesar and our employee engagement and finance teams 
uh, who've administered premium pay over the course of this year. Uh, it's been a, a challenging year, obviously, and we're going to hear more about that over the course of today's agenda. Uh, but it's taken special focus um, uh, on the payroll uh, to make this benefit possible during the pandemic. So uh, kudos to, to Cesar and Jerry and their folks. Um, at our last board meeting, uh, we spent a little bit of time talking about a land acquisition plan. Uh, I want to just let the board know that we're making very good progress on that. Um, and we expect to be able to come back uh, to the board at our next meeting uh, with, a, with a comprehensive and, and positive update. Um, and then finally, um, I think you probably all saw the news release that I forwarded by email at the beginning of the week announcing the opening date for the Northgate link extension. So that's big news and I was invited by Sound Transit to, to participate in that announcement uh, Friday morning on short notice. Um, the opening date will be October 2nd. Uh, which is a Saturday. It's two weeks to the day after uh, our current planned service change, which would be September 18th. Uh, Sound Transit has asked both uh, Community Transit and King County Metro to adjust uh, our service change dates from the 18th to October 2nd to align services uh, with a single change uh, that, that uh, coincides with the opening of the rail line. And I've given direction to the team to to plan to make that happen. Um, so obviously, this is huge news uh, for the whole region and uh, and for our commuters and customers. Uh, this will be the first opportunity for us to provide that direct express bus connection uh, to the north end uh, of Seattle, which will give our riders an opportunity to bypass the Ship Canal Bridge and the Mercer Mess and, and the Long Slog into downtown. Customary in the past. So, more to come on that as we get closer to it, but I wanted to just flag that as, as big news. Uh, the balance of my CEO report is dedicated to recognizing someone very special to this agency. Uh, board members here are accustomed to our tradition of recognizing folks for milestones. We've got a, a joint milestone here. Um, one of our longest serving and our most respected employees, Dave Richards, uh, is retiring at the end of this month, April 30th. And we are here today to recognize his tenure with community transit and his many, many accomplishments. And it also coincidentally is occurring on the anniversary of uh, the 25th anniversary of his first day as a community transit employee. So we, we planned that perfectly just for that reason. Um, there's Dave. Uh, thanks for joining us here center stage. I know how much you like to be the center of attention, Dave. So you're just going to have to put up with us for the next few minutes while we torture you. So, but the, it'll be worth it because this is your very last board meeting uh, before you head off to greener pastures at the end of this month. So um, let's just, there's not really any words. What an amazing career you've had, Dave. Um, this is an opportunity for, for your peers, uh, for the board members and the employees to, to recognize uh, formally and officially uh, what an amazing run you've had here and what an invaluable contribution you've made to this organization and to the people of Snohomish County. Um, I'm going to say a little bit about Dave's early career and his journey uh, to community transit. Um, and a few other anecdotes that we picked up along the way. Uh, for those who may not know, uh, before coming to work at Community Transit, Dave served a long first career with the United States Marine Corps. 20 years of distinguished service, retiring as a, a Lieutenant Colonel. Uh, and for those of you who know Marines or are Marines, have lived with Marines, have friends who are Marines, you know that once a Marine, always a Marine. So Semper Fidelis Dave, thank you for that part of your service. Um, he did a brief stint at the city of Renton before coming to CT. And the interesting thing to me about this is between the Marine Corps, and the city of Renton and community transit, the entirety of Dave's career has been in public service. And that's a remarkable feat. We don't see that very much anymore. And uh, I think it's 
especially notable uh, in this time and this place we're in in our country where public service isn't always valued as highly as it should be. So congratulations to that accomplishment as well, Dave. Uh, Dave joined CT in 1996 as the maintenance shop manager. In 1999, he became the vehicle maintenance manager and he's been serving as the director of maintenance uh, since 2006, an impressive 15 year run. In terms of growth, okay, dang it. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yes, we can. All right, my, my whole screen just went black and blinked out, so uh, I apologize for that glitch. Kind of interrupted my, my excellent riff on Dave. <laughs> anyway, um, I talked about his public service. I talked about his record at Community Transit. I wanted to talk about some of the changes that have occurred and some of the uh, ups and downs that Dave has negotiated as part of the executive team here. He's lived through radical downsizing and adversity uh, such as that, which was caused by I-695 uh, back in the mid-90s and again in the Great Recession. Uh, he's worked with the executive team to guide the agency through those traumas uh, to deal with difficult reductions in service, uh, difficult reductions in force. Um, and he's also been there right with us on our major expansions of service and our new investments, uh, such as the blue line and the swift line, or the green line, uh, just a couple of years ago. Um, the Proposition 1 campaign in 2015 um, that brought the promise of an expanded BRT system to Snohomish County. Um, to be able to do that successfully, up and down, and sustain success really uh, it takes a measurable skill uh, and also leadership qualities that are uncommon, uh, a sense of duty to the employees and care and compassion for the organization. Um, those are some of Dave's most notable traits. And I, I think it's fair to say that we wouldn't be here as an, as an organization without the contributions that he's made. Um, I've only known Dave a very short time as I just joined the organization at the beginning of the year. Many of you have known it for much longer. And many of the employees who are on the call today have known him even longer than that. Um, we reached out uh, to get a little bit of background and some observations from some of those folks. I'm not going to share all of it, but there are some themes and some, some trends that came through the feedback that we got. Uh, one is his commitment to service and his focus on the mission. And you see that as, as Dave is someone with tremendous uh, public service values. He's very results oriented. He's somebody you can count on 100% of the time, um, who trusts his employees and who earns the trust of his employees in return. Um, he's engaged with his peers. He's loyal to the agency and to the people around him. And he's a critical partner uh, to our external uh, partners. Uh, Emmett Heath sent us a few notes uh, and I'd like to read uh, one of the comments that, that he made, and I quote, both of Dave's careers have been mission focused. At Community Transit, I always knew Dave could be counted on to achieve any objective he was given in support of the overall mission. There are many measures of success for a person in Dave's leadership role. He leads his teams to deliver quality and timely performance with extraordinary results that exceed expectations. Another quality I admire is Dave's ability to comprehend a mission, understand the objectives, plan to achieve them, and deliver results with an absolute minimum of guidance or oversight. Community Transit was fortunate to have Dave Richards for his second public career. Joy Munkers sent some notes as well. Uh, she remarked 
that there was an enormous amount of growth in fleet and facilities over the past 25 years under his leadership. And Dave was instrumental in the design of buses, park and rides, technology projects, procurement of buses, his hands-on knowledge uh, was impressive, often catching things that even the technology experts didn't catch. A few data points, Dave, when you came in 1996, CT had a fleet of 133 vehicles. Today, it's over 320, and it consists of quite a few different models that have evolved over the years, including the swift articulated buses, the double talls, and many different types of 30, 40, and 60 foot coaches. We estimate that Dave has participated in the procurement of nearly 500 buses, plus hundreds more paratransit and service vehicles, and he's been involved every step of the way uh, from design to purchase to delivery to maintain quality uh, when delivered and after put in service. Dave's collaborated incredibly well with our labor partners and built a relationship of genuine trust and respect. Uh, his extraordinary level of labor management cooperation is reflected in a low level of grievances sometimes going a year or more without a single grievance being filed. So I'm not sure why that is, Dave, but I'd like to learn more. Dave's been innovative. He's been part of many firsts at the agency, including our entry into ORCA, uh, the one regional card for all, our regional fair media, and the installation of that system in all our vehicles and facilities. APTS, the aforementioned double tall buses, our hybrid buses, which I know he loves, uh, and our BRT stations with the ticket vending machines. And more recently, he's been involved uh, in installation of new technology systems, our voice over internet protocol uh, communication system and, and our, our drive cam system that we're in the process of installing. It's fitting, this is a workshop where we're presenting the board and our attendees on our approach, our proposed approach to the zero emission vehicle study. I'm told it was a workshop just like this one, except in person, uh, back in 2017, where you presented the first state of the electric vehicle technology. You've been the agency's go-to expert on vehicle technology, Dave, purchasing and maintenance, scouting new options, keeping up to date on emerging trends, it's been incredibly impactful in our progression, and uh, your fingerprints will be on the approach we take to looking at zero emission vehicles um, over the next year, year and a half. And Dave, really, what's a career without a global pandemic? <laughs> you and your staff have been instrumental in ensuring that we never missed a day of service. You've reported every day. You've ensured the vehicles in our buildings remain safe, in good condition. You've really stepped up to support the quick and effective implement excuse me, implementation of new safety measures and protocols on our vehicles and at our bases to help keep employees and customers safe all the way through the pandemic. Again, without your leadership, Dave, I'm not sure we'd have the same result. So thank you for your service, for being part of so many things that make this agency successful, that make it an enjoyable place to work. I regret that we won't have a chance to work together much longer. I feel like I've already benefited immeasurably this last three months uh, from your counsel and, and watching and observing your response to issues and challenges. So thank you for that. Um, I know how much your employees are gonna miss you because they're effusive, Dave, and how much they admire you. So this isn't the only farewell we're gonna have. I know staff is planning some additional ways to say farewell in coming days and weeks. So we, we may have some more uh, opportunities and maybe some less formal settings, but um, it, it's important to, to note and mark your service here with the board um, on an occasion like this. And it's been my honor to, to recognize you uh, in this way, uh, in the presence of the board and all the employees that are listening along. So thank you, Dave for everything you've done for CT. Uh, and uh, in response, if you have anything to say in your own defense, I suspect the chair would recognize you to do so. Go ahead, Dave, we'd love to hear from you. Just a few short comments. 
I, I don't think uh, in my professional life that I've ever needed or wanted or searched for accolades. I always hope that I met other people's expectations. I can say my time here, I think I've enjoyed almost every day. None of us can say we enjoy every day, um, but I greatly appreciate the opportunity to have worked here at Community Transit, to work for the various boards and board members, uh, to work for the three CEOs, Joyce, Emmett, and now Rick, and the opportunities and freedom they gave me to do my job. You know, and after the years in the Marine Corps and the 25 years as of today, uh, here at Community Transit, I, I kind of feel that it's time uh, to turn the rein over to someone else and let them succeed uh, with new future, exciting efforts with community transit. You know, I leave, I think, community transit with great confidence that the people that are here, especially those that I know within the department, um, will continue to provide the quality service, you know, the clean, the reliable, the safe vehicles uh, and facilities. They are a great group of people as are all others in the company. Uh, but I especially appreciate those in the maintenance department because as we all know, our successes are made by the people that work for us. I, I think I, you know, I, I have heard over the years, many people have different comments. And as I was contemplating retirement, I was reminded of uh, General Douglas MacArthur when uh, he, in his retirement speech to the joint session of uh, Congress, one thing that I'd like to paraphrase is that old Marines and maintenance directors never die. They just fade away. And I, I think it's time for me just to fade away. And to all of you, thanks for the memories. Thank you, Dave. Uh, Chair Dottry, can I say anything to Dave? Go ahead. I, yeah, Dave, um, just thank you, man. I, I am so glad that I was able to be back on the board um, to be able to, you know, uh, see you into your retirement. And I just want to thank you so much for um, my dad worked for you in that department and, uh, you know, from kind of one Marine to another, right? Um, but anyway, so I just want to thank you for the, all the uh, time and effort and uh, tremendous uh, job that you've done for community transit and you're just, you're a great guy. And uh, hopefully we'll, you won't move too far away in retirement, we'll still be able to see it. Anybody else from the board wish to comment? Go ahead, John. Yeah, Dave, it's been a pleasure working with you these past, gosh, I think it's been 11, 12 years now. Uh, as a board member and uh, you've just been a rock there. And uh, I know how much your staff appreciates you and how much um, the board appreciates you and uh, the CEOs that you've worked for have appreciated you. So congratulations, enjoy your retirement. Thanks for all you've done for Community Transit. Thank you, John, anybody else? Well, I would just like to say that I was pretty impressed with Dave. Um, when I first got to the board, you know, sometimes you, we look at board members as being um, maybe sitting up on a pedestal or whatever. I've never really bought into that, but I always thought it was impressive when we'd have a, a briefing by Dave and uh, he would be quick to point out a you know, misdirection that we were going, you know, or uh, if we were misinterpreting something, he would, he would step up real quick and, and put us in our place and let us know uh, that we were going down the wrong path and, uh, and probably just misinterpreted what he was saying or, or whatever it was. But I always thought it was kind of refreshing that Dave didn't have a problem uh, stepping up. I knew he was in the Marines. I didn't realize he was a Lieutenant Colonel. So now I know where it all came from. But, uh, um, you know, and remember, Dave, though, it, uh, if it wasn't for the Navy, you guys wouldn't get anywhere. So just don't forget that. 
Anyway, yeah. have a great okay. retirement. <laughs> have a great retirement, Dave. I really appreciate the years of service that you've done for our community and for our nation. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, Rick, I think we're ready to move on. Okay. Thanks again, Dave. <clears throat> and thanks to the board uh, for helping us acknowledge his service. So now we're gonna move into our program. Um, I think uh, Rachel is going to uh, share a, a slide deck. Um, so our topics today um, are as follows. We didn't have a board workshop in January, so it's been quite a while since the last workshop. Um, our all-consuming focus for the last really 14 months has been um, responding to the COVID-19 pandemic. And we've been updating you off and on, you know, on a monthly basis at our meetings uh, about how things have been going. Uh, but we thought it'd be worth uh, spending some time uh, to make a comprehensive report on how the agency has fared uh, over the past year, what, our, what we've experienced, uh, where we find ourselves, and share some of our thoughts on where we think the agency should go next. Uh, based on what we've experienced, based on what we've learned, um, based on uh, how our writers have responded and where they are now. Um, so we're going to spend some time um, looking back, kind of a year in the review, uh, and then looking forward. Um, I really want to make this uh, about considering the pivot away from reacting to COVID-19 uh, toward uh, growing out and recovering from it and embracing a brighter and, and hopefully more ambitious future. Uh, I wouldn't for a second say that we're through this pandemic. Uh, I mentioned that at the top of the program. We're still in it and we still have to be vigilant and we still have to do all the things that are necessary to stay safe and, and pull out of it. And that includes getting vaccinated. That includes adhering to our public health measures. Um, Cesar will talk a little bit about this later in the program, but we've had a couple of cases just this week. So it is not gone away, it's still here. Uh, but the trend is in a good direction and the vaccines are beginning to make their way through the population. And we're seeing an opportunity to think about what comes next. And so that's, that's the focus of, of today's discussion. Um, after we cover the pandemic, and our pivot away from the pandemic, we do want to spend, because it's part and parcel of the same topic, a little bit of time at the end of the agenda uh, talking about how we want to approach the zero emission fleet study. Um, we've talked informally and at some of our committee and board meetings already this year uh, about this study and our intent to, to wade into the technology and, and do a deep dive and see what we think makes sense for community transit. So we want to lay out for you how we're proposing to do that work and get your thoughts uh, before we take off after it. So that'll, that'll wrap up our program. So let's jump right in. Um, our COVID report is organized into three groupings, three topics. Uh, we want to focus first on the customer experience, uh, how our customers experienced uh, COVID-19, uh, where our customer base is right now, uh, how the services have per performed uh, over the past year plus, and, and then talk a little bit about what we think we need to do uh, to re-engage with the riders who aren't using transit, uh, to retain the ones who are, uh, and to continue to engage them and how we can best serve the county. Uh, secondly, we'll do something very similar, but from the standpoint of the employees. Um, how did the employees respond? How did they experience COVID-19? Uh, where are we at right now as an organization and our workforce? Uh, and, and how do we see uh, coming out of the pandemic uh, and bringing folks back to base and uh, resuming a, a more normal working operation? And then thirdly, uh, the, the financial lens. Uh, what we did to respond to the pandemic initially, um, how that uh, worked for us uh, and where we find ourselves now as we get ready to um, 
engage in the 2022 budget process and the next update of our transit development plan. So this has been an all out agency effort. Um, and you know, you're, I've asked several of the directors to participate in presenting information today. Um, there's a lot here. So I want you to feel as you always do empowered to jump in. If you see something you wanna dive a little deeper on or, or ask a question about, um, we'll also reserve a few minutes at the end of each of these three modules for additional board Q and A. Um, but as always, we, we hope to, to make this an engaging um, conversation and, a, and, a, and include some, some give and take. Um, before I turn it over to Roland and Molly um, to talk about the customer experience, uh, I want to remind the board we've been operating under an incident command system uh, since last spring. Um, incident command is, is, a, is a FEMA prescribed structure uh, that is part of our emergency operations plan. Um, and it's a structure that allows us to respond internally and externally quickly and effectively and in a coordinated way to crises, uh, emergent issues, uh, incidents of, of any kind, seismic, uh, weather, terrorism, pandemics. So, our incident command structure has been stood up since last spring. And uh, part of our recovery from the pandemic and part of bringing our employees back to the base uh, will include bringing the ICS uh, process to a close. Uh, we haven't set a specific date for doing that. Um, we're gonna continue to monitor cases in the county and in the region and the rate of vaccination but it's important to point out that the folks who staff the ICS process uh, are our safety and security personnel. And they have a lot of other responsibilities. Um, so they're really busy all the time. And um, we're hoping that part of our brighter future is that we'll be able to bring the ICS uh, to a close and free those resources up uh, to get uh, refocused on all aspects of our safety and security programs. So um, with that in mind, um, let's move into the body of our presentation. Um, I'd like to recognize Roland Behe, our Director of Planning and Development, and Molly Marsicek, our Director of Customer Experience. Uh, they're gonna uh, talk about the customer experience, where we've been and where we think we're going next. So Roland, Molly. Thanks, Rick. Um, you know, as Rick said, this has been uh, uh, an extraordinary, remarkable year uh, over the past uh, 14 some months. There really isn't any precedent uh, in terms of the, uh, the level of ridership impact that we've seen as an agency uh, or with the responsiveness in terms of um, uh, how involved and, and all encompassing our response from a, from a service perspective has been. Uh, from a safety measure perspective to ensure the safety of, of riders and also of our staff. Um, so, you know, we've been, as Rick said, we've been giving the board uh, regular updates throughout the past year. And for now, uh, you know, this is the time we can look back and really give more of a global perspective and overview uh, of what the year looked like. So that's really what Molly and I will uh, will do in the next few minutes here is, is cover the the year interview from um, from more of that uh, strategic perspective to uh, to try and really um, give a sense of what it all looks like, and also to then begin to pivot to look forward and say um, what comes next from both a uh, um, a service, a ridership, and a, and a customer experience perspective. Uh, so next slide, Rachel. So this first slide gives the, the high level overview in terms of ridership for the entire system. So we're looking at the, the sum of everything we do for bus, bus rapid transit, van pool, and the DART service. And uh, just to orient um, to the chart, the, uh, we're showing a three year look with 2018, 2019, and then the right hand uh, uh, set of bars is the year that just uh, was completed 2020. And the overall impression you can see this immediate drop um, so it's, you know, it's obvious that we've had a, a dramatic impact on ridership, 49% uh, reduction 
over last year. And, and do keep in mind as we go through these slides, we, we had a couple of relatively normal months at the beginning of the year with January and February before we really uh, started to see the, the impacts in earnest as we got into March, April, and May. Um, on the on the right hand side, you can see that overall result. We were, you know, um, one of the few agencies in the nation that was seeing uh, any kind of significant ridership growth pre-pandemic. So we had uh, increased from 10.6 million in 2018 to over 11 million in 2019. We launched the Swift Green Line on this upward trend, and and then boom, uh, pandemic hits, and you know we see that impact. So we're at 5.68 million last year in terms of boardings. Uh, the one thing I'll call attention to in the in the column charts, uh, as you look at those numbers, you can see in particular the um, uh, the lighter blue color in the middle of those bars. That's rep representing the Swift BRT services, and you can see that increase in 2019 as we launched the Green Line. We actually had a 33% increase in that line of business in 2019, which was great progress. And likewise, in 2020, you know, the overall story is a huge downturn in ridership overall, but it's notable, and this will be a recurring theme over the next few slides, um, that BRT was the least impacted of our services, um, a 14% drop, which when you compare to the other areas where we're seeing, um, you know, drops that are in the uh, high 50s to, uh, to 60 plus percent, um, it's, a, it's a mark of the success of that line of service. So just a, a notable stat. Next slide, Rachel. So this uh, next few slides will um, dive into the modes individually, and this is the fixed route service. So all of our bus services, the uh, columns on the left indicate the quarterly performance for each of those years, again, 18, 19, and 20. And uh, you can see that the, you know, the biggest impact really hit us immediately in quarter two as the whole community shut down. So that's when we see that 63% drop uh, year over year, uh, and then some modest recovery as we as we got into third quarter. Again, very modest, and you know we continue to see um, some slow recovery, but uh, but we still are are down considerably, um, obviously over over the previous year. I'll note also the productivity numbers in the box in the upper right. Um, you can see that we uh, were at nearly 24 boardings an hour in 2018 that dropped to just under 23 boardings an hour in 2019. And that was really as a result of increase in volume. We, we added substantial uh, to the number of service hours with the launch of the Green Line. And we anticipated that ridership would catch up as that market builds. We still anticipate that happening over the long term, but that was, the, that was why productivity dropped last year as we increased the volume of service. And then, of course, you know the current numbers way down, and that's both because of a drop in boardings, um, uh, and we have mitigated to some extent by reducing the level of service. You see, dropping from 439,000 service hours to about 360,000 service hours, which I'll talk about later. Next slide. So this is a real interesting chart that shows that impact broken out by individual type of route. And so the, the bars are, you know, these are all negative bars. So they, they proceed from the zero line uh, at the right-hand side of the chart to uh, a negative figure to the left. The biggest impacts um, are in our commuter services. And so, you know, no surprise, major uh, companies, Microsoft, Amazon, all the downtown Seattle employers, um, University of Washington, uh, all immediately went to a, a work from home or study from home mode. And that really hit our, our peak directional commute services. And so you see those, you know, 70, uh, 60 to 70% drops year over year. The actual month over month drops were, you know, approaching 90% um, in, these, in these services. As we get into the more um, local services within the county, you can see those are um, those do considerably better. Still, major reductions uh, in the in the forty to fifty percent range, and then Swift at fourteen percent year over year. So um, the the takeaway here is the diversified services that have a variety of trip purposes are the ones that have retained more ridership, and that's really where the essential travel is taking place. People are going to their medical appointments, they're going to the grocery store, taking care of that essential business, and that's really um, reflected in the numbers that we see here. Next slide. So we're talking here about Vanpool, 
And uh, again, the trend with 18, 19, and 20, and the very major drop in 2020. Vanpool, again, a highly commute-focused service to major employers. So the numbers here are in alignment with what you saw with the commuter side of the bus market with a 60-plus uh, percent drop. And, uh, and you can see, you know, as we got into the, um, the, the first quarter of the pandemic in Q2, nearly an 80 percent um, reduction year over year. So um, the, uh, you know, we've done some, some creative things to try and maintain as much of this market as possible. Uh, we, um, we made modifications to our fare policy to try and keep as many vans in the hands of van pool groups as possible under the presumption that they would be more uh, amenable to coming back when the market returns. So we, uh, we right now have um, about 245 vans still in customers' hands, about 173 vans are back with the agency and, and available for new groups. And of those 245 vans, there's more than 100 of those that are, that are with groups, but they're not being actively used. So we're charging a base charge for those vans, but they're not incurring any mileage fees. So, uh, you know, really um, on this first service, we're continuing to monitor the market and uh, really trying to remain flexible moving forward as we, um, as we determine, you know, what is the future of this mode going to be uh, as, uh, as commuter patterns become clear over the next few months. Next slide. And here we're looking at our DART dial -a ride transit services. Uh, again, very significant drop uh, in 2020. And um, you can see, uh, you know, this is our, our most vulnerable group of customers. Uh, and so, you know, all of the discretionary trips um, eliminated immediately. And, and these folks really just doing the most essential of essential trips. Um, getting to those really critical medical appointments, um, you know, getting out to get food, et cetera. But uh, normal, uh, normal circumstances, we would be seeing 600 plus trips provided per day on a, on a typical weekday. And in the early weeks of the pandemic, those numbers dropped down to well under 100 per day. And some of that is built back now to where we're, you know, we're, we're uh, approaching 200 trips per weekday, but a long ways to go on this market. Um, other, you know, other note in this area, we did transition vendors last year. Uh, and so we uh, transitioned from Homage, our longtime provider, to Transdev, um, our new provider. And so there was a, both impacts of the pandemic and also impacts of a new operator. And, uh, you know, early days on that are that we're having a really promising experience with Transdev and our on-time performance is doing really well. So uh, we're, we're doing everything we can to make sure that the service is ready and available when customers are ready to come back. Next slide. So then uh, looking back at a full year of that activity, uh, this, this gives a sense of what did that actually look like as it played out on a weekly basis. And so this chart shows uh, the, the year before the pandemic, 2019 in the, in the gray line at the top, and then the full year of the pandemic in the, in the dark blue line. And what we're seeing year to date so far in 2021 in that lighter blue line toward the left-hand side of the chart. And this is that total ridership on a weekly basis. And you know what's really telling here is uh, on, our, on our best days now, we, uh, or best weeks, we are still somewhat below um, you know, what would be normally our lowest ridership weeks as an agency. And so those would be you know, the weeks of during the holidays or, doing, or during very major weather events. So we clearly have um, a long ways to go uh, you know, until the community has truly opened up again and we're seeing a, a return to travel demand that is on a scale that we're accustomed to serving. Um, but this gives you a sense of you know, really how that trend played out. And also that we're, we're now, you know, because we're 14 months or 15 months into this, we're, we're beginning to compare our current performance uh, to, uh, to a year ago when we were in the pandemic. So we're really comparing pandemic to pandemic in terms of, of where we're at and starting to look at that year over year performance. So um, we will continue to monitor this on a, on a regular basis. There is a lot of focus um, in, our, in our data group on uh, daily, weekly and monthly reporting really allowing us to, to be as um, responsive as possible in terms of putting service where, uh, where the demand is. And I'll talk a little bit about that uh, later in the presentation. I want to hand it off to Molly now um, to talk about, uh, you know, th these, are, these are numerical statistics. Molly's going to put a face on a lot of this and really um, help the board understand what this was like from a, from a direct customer experience. So Molly, I'll hand it over to you. Thanks, Rowan. 
Remember these? <laughs> Over a year ago, they would pop up. We'd run to our TV. We'd see what the latest change would be and how COVID was impacting everybody. Um, and that it did, our service um, and how people got around and who's getting around dramatically changed. Um, so if we go to the next slide, we can see and think about, well, who, who was really writing? Roland talked about the stats of, of what writership looked like, but who, who is writing? We did a um, survey in the beginning of the pandemic around the May timeframe to start to get a feeling for what are people thinking? What are they, what are they responding to? How are they thinking about transit in general? And then we just got fresh off the press results um, back from something we released out in February this year. So where are we at now? Um, <clears throat> these are top line, meaning haven't completely been scrubbed. Um, they're kind of generic. We don't have all of the information yet. So we'll be getting more information in yet, but I'll go through what some of the results are looking like and what we have learned from customers. Um, so customers right now are more likely, obviously, to work outside of the home. Um, they identify as something other than white. Um, lower income, don't have access to vehicles as, as much, um, which means they're really relying on us to get around. And as a result of that, we heard never miss the day of service um, and heard many compliments from our customers, uh, just really thanking us for being there every day because they depend on us so much to get to where they need to go. Next slide. Overall, what was really cool is um, when we did the survey last year, our, our safety per, uh, people's perception of safety on transit was a little bit lower and now it's higher, which was a goal of ours. We need to help people start to think about safety and, and how they can travel safety, safely on our services. Um, but then likelihood to recommend our service to others has gone down. So what's the cause of kind of both of those things as far as we know right now? Next slide. Um, if we look at safety, we ask customers um, the question, how much do the follow following bus service improvements increase the chance that you will, that you will use our service? So if we have a whole bunch of things to offer customers, um, what would they most like us to do and help them, help them know how safe, safe our service is? At the top of the chart, you'll see things like um, disinfecting the buses, uh, and better air filters on buses are really important for people. Um, social distancing masks. And then lower at the bottom, less important for people with the safety messages. People are getting safety messages everywhere, right? <laughs> um, and then kind of the backdoor entry on SWIFT was less important for them. Um, we have heard through our customer service channels, um, operators, anybody talking to customers, um, some different opportunities for improvements. This may be the reason um, people are less likely to recommend it. Also in general, people are just not as happy right now. <laughs> um, but um, some of the things that we have heard during this stressful time from our customers is just imagine how much has changed just to get on the bus every day. How do you do it? What are the rules? What's changed? How do you, uh, where do I sit? Where can I not sit? Um, so that cause, causes different stress and different conversations with people. Um, we, we also, because a lot less people are traveling into Seattle um, and a lot of people are staying locally and we, we're hearing a lot of the voices um, that we've always heard, we're just hearing them more often um, from people that really rely on us. And we're, we're identifying that we, there are opportunities for us to serve um, this group differently and better. And so we wanna look at that and try to figure out what we can do there to help customers um, that are relying on us every single day. Um, the interesting thing is, you know, whoever thought we'd have to deal with early bus arrival times, that's never been anything that we've had to deal with in our past. Uh, it's always been, you know, too much traffic and late. And, and then we started to see buses getting there early. And so then it's hard for people to understand when to get there. So just interesting things that we haven't had to deal with before. Um, but I really view them as, as kind of gems for opportunity and how to improve. Next slide. Roland kind of covered the van pool um, experience. 
Um, we started off before COVID just kicking butt really, right? Like we were larger than we had ever been before. Uh, there was a wait list for people wanting more vans um, to get to work. And then it just changed just like everything else. So we really are like Roland said, looking at how, how can we provide flexibility? How does the service need to change in order to keep up with everything else that's changing around us? Next slide. Good news is from the survey, 68% uh, of the people that are currently not riding say they're somewhat likely or very likely to come back to our service. So, I mean, that's, that's fantastic. And that's, that's just um, where, where we're at right now. And I see that number growing as traffic grows and all the other demands of needing to get around starts to change. Um, and, and when they come back, we'll have to do with people getting vaccinated and um, employers that, that sent people home calling them back. So what are we gonna do about that? Next slide. Uh, they won't just come back on their own. <laughs> It's a whole mix of things that get, get ridership back. And one of that is customer experience. And by that, I don't mean an apartment that I manage. I mean, everything that our entire company and agency is doing in order to, to make the experience good for the customers. That is number one thing that has to be done. And then two, we have to talk about safety. We have to get people to believe and get over the hump, the ones that aren't riding, um, that it's safe. And so you may have seen it uh, and we'll show some, some creative coming up. Uh, we're out there right now talking about safety and we'll be doing that for the future. And then we'll move to a return to ridership. We've got to cover safety first. Next slide. So a little bit more about the safety campaign. You may have seen some of these creatives on Facebook or popping up on your social media channels or, um, that even gonna go out, out of home and print and TV, et cetera. So um, our goal here is really to influence the perception of safety and do that in a personal um, way, connection it, that provides hope for people. And then set the stage later for our chance um, to promote. Um, we're, we already are, we're targeted to hit over a million impressions right now with the safety campaign, which is really great. The more people see it and hear it, uh, the better. So um, we're excited about this campaign. Next. Uh, we're, gonna, we're gonna show you if you haven't seen it, which you probably haven't yet, because it's just starting to get out there on cable a video um, of a like safety commercial. So you can see this. Rachel, we can't hear it. But isn't it lovely? <laughs> Highlighting all of the work. <laughs> that... Sorry, you guys, I realized I was on mute. Let me start that over again. <laughs> Every day to make sure you're right. When you have places There's... to go, community <laughs> transit is here to get you there safely. From things you see, like safety gear for our drivers, masks for our riders, and seats closed off for safe distancing to things you don't, like daily disinfecting and upgraded air filters. We work hard every day to make sure your ride with us is a safe and healthy one. Learn more about how you can ride safely throughout Snohomish County and beyond at communitytransit.org slash safe ride. So well, that'll be airing on our, our uh, media channels um, locally to help people just Imprint, imprint everything that um, everyone's been doing over the year um, to create a safe ride. And lastly, um, we really have to work with our regional partners. Rachel, next slide. Okay. Um, in order to pull this off, we wanna make sure that we're really thinking um, together as a region in transit to drive a holistic view 
um, of safety and then returning the ridership. So um, during the COVID response, we really worked together to, um, to coordinate messaging. Um, and we did an essential worker campaign. I don't know if you remember, but those are some clips on the right of some of the images of that. Um, and um, talked about ideas, concerns, and what we're what do, and how we're working together for messaging. And now going forward, we are meeting regionally to really discuss return to ridership, how and when. Um, we really need to work together to coordinate the kind of conversation, the timing, the messaging. Um, obviously, there's plans for a big, a big hoopla to launch Northgate. Uh, which we look forward to doing. Um, we're looking at potentially a September time frame, but gosh, you know, uh, today everyone gets 100 is eligible for vaccines, right? So <laughs> you plan something and then there's another change that happens. So we have to continue to adjust and be flexible with what's going on around us and be careful of uh, capacity and uh, measuring how much capacity there is on the bus as we have the social distancing to how many work riders we can really try to get back. Um, so we don't want them, we don't want to leave them behind. <laughs> they come and then we have to pass them because the bus is full. So uh, really working together with the region to make sure that, that we're coordinated, talking and working through this. Uh, and now passing it back to Roland to finish us out and then give you some time for questions. Thanks, Molly. Yeah, so just, just to conclude this section, just a couple of thoughts about uh, service levels, tracking with ridership, and then what Molly talked about in terms of pivoting toward, um, toward next steps for the remainder of the year. I think we've shared an earlier version of this chart with the board, and it gives um, both a, a longer term look at where we have been as an agency all the way back to 2008 in terms of our service levels. The, the vertical bars in the chart represent the annual hours of bus service that we put on the road. And you can see that, you know, that starts at 400,000 plus hours back in the, you know, in the late 2008-9 range before the Great Recession. Um, and that was accompanied also by a, an early peak in ridership associated uh, with $4 gas prices. And then as we move to the right, you can see the impact of those major service cuts during the recession as we right-sized service, um, a, a somewhat um, substantial drop in ridership. Uh, and then starting to build again as we um, as we received the ballot measure funding in 2015 and 16, we restored Sunday service, uh, continued to build, and then you know a big bump up when we launched the Green Line in um, in uh, March of 2019. And uh, and then you see what we talked about earlier in this presentation with this substantial drop in service levels last year and a dramatic drop in ridership. And it helps to give some sense for scale in terms of the level of ridership impact we've seen versus previous um, downturns in the market. It is at an unprecedented scale for us. The other thing that just highlights is um, in that uh, third bar from the right, uh, you can see there are several levels of service that we um, provided last year. We did uh, really five service changes um, over the course of about nine months, and you know normally we do two. So it just it reflects not only the the change or responsiveness to changing conditions um, out on the road, uh, but also just the you know the level of work that we were undertaking as an agency. These are each uh, you know major initiatives. So. Um, as we move forward, uh, you can see the, the dark blue bar on the right represents a relatively minor uptick in service that will be associated with uh, what now is known as the October service change, as, as Rick shared with the October 2nd opening date for Northgate Link. We will um, reorganize our 800 series bus routes uh, to serve that. Sound Transit service that we operate will also be reorganized to serve that, uh, that station. And we'll also be adding a modest number of trips on the rest of the system to accommodate um, social distancing and capacity as we, you know, as we uh, understand that moving forward for the rest of the year. Uh, you can see the trend line in ridership, which is the orange line that we're tracking on this chart. We are anticipating a substantial growth in ridership between now and the fall as the community opens up, as we start to get a more fully vaccinated population. As Molly said, you know, we're, we're planning for that. Um, we need to see how that actually plays out and, and um, you know, whether it actually tracks with, um, with our forecast. But for now, uh, we are planning on providing that capacity and, um, and you know, we're going to be providing this very compelling connection um, at Northgate. Next slide. 
And so speaking of that, um, just, you know, our priorities for this, for this next period of service development are to maintain that safe distancing. Uh, I talked earlier about our real focus on, on uh, very current and timely data on capacity on buses on the system and um, how, how passengers are distributed. You can see a representation at the bottom of the slide here on, you know, we've established new capacity guidelines for our buses. We're tracking that on a daily basis. Steve, a little bit later, is going to talk about some of our very dynamic and responsive operational strategies to provide standby buses where we have crowding. Um, we're also really tracking changes in the commuter travel market and communicating with major employers to get ahead of what their plans are, um, try to be anticipating uh, where we're going to need capacity as the year progresses. And then light rail at Northgate. Um, you can see a, a picture here. This is actually from a major testing event we had just this last Saturday. We had uh, some uh, critical operational and customer experience and planning staff and training staff out on site. Uh, we had our contractor first transit as well as our direct operations staff there to really do some road testing on how is this actually going to work? What's the curb space look like? What are the customer movements look like? What are some of those final coordination points that we need to, um, to iron out before we're ready to go in October? And uh, we're also anticipating that to meet our ridership recovery goals and be ready for this opening, we will likely see some um, modification to these capacity figures on coaches. And it's really too weirdly to say when that will happen or what that will look like, but we anticipate that we're, um, we're gonna be relaxing those requirements as the, as the population is more fully vaccinated and um, as it becomes safe to do so. So more to come on this, but there's a lot of uh, planning underway right now, a lot of um, tracking of, of ridership and data and uh, trying to anticipate what's going to be needed in terms of, um, of service needs. So that's the end of our presentation for now, uh, for the segment that, uh, that Molly and I are leading. And I'm gonna turn it back to Chair Daughtry at this point, and Molly and I would be happy to answer any questions the board would have. Well, thank you, uh, Roland and Molly, for your uh, really good presentation. Would the board, uh, anybody on the board be interested in asking any questions? Go ahead, Jan. Sorry, I got on mute. Uh, so, um, in the things that, that you've had to adapt to and change over the last year, have you found that there's been things that have worked really well that you're going to continue even after we get back to normal? Um, there's probably a number of, you know, uh, if, if allowed to reflect further on that, I'm sure there are many things that we have learned that, you know, have been really instructive lessons. I, I would say, I think there are some new muscles that we have discovered around our, um, uh, th this is the example that I'll give, I guess, our entire cycle of uh, data collection, analysis, and also research. Uh, and I would say that that has been, um, you know, both on the, on the daily cycle in terms of uh, being able to say, you know, this morning, what happened on the system yesterday, <laughs> and, and to turn that around to operational folks and be able to provide some level of um, uh, anticipation on where we may need extra capacity or resources. We got really good at doing that. And, you know, my staff was sending, you know, even up to the governor's office, um, ridership reports on a daily basis, not too far into this event. So, so the pace of being able to stay ahead mm -hmm. of information like that and also provide that to customers um, for their use is, is one thing I think that we've learned. Um, and in a similar way, the ability to deploy surveys very quickly. Molly spoke to some of this with the, with the customer pulse survey results. Another one that we've gotten, um, you know, we're getting better at rapid research and immediately putting some of those results to use. I would just add to that um, kind of a, a theme of what Roland's saying, the ability to change quickly. Right, like there's, we don't have to like wait always, we can test and try and do. Um, and I think the more we can do that in transit and respond to needs, uh, the better that we'll get in the, in the long run. And, and it's been fun in a forced way to need to do that and to show that we can, we can do these, we can do different than it has been. And I think that's gonna be really beneficial for us in the long run and our customers. Hey, Joe. Thank you. Picture. Um, so Roland or Molly, um, looking at that picture a few slides ago, we were showing the six foot separation on the buses. 
Um, how is it possible that we could get ridership even to the kind of half what we had uh, prior to you know that drop off in in March of 2020? Um, and I know you guys said you know it, you're going to have buses on standby, but it just seems you know, especially the commuter routes were full and had people standing and not being able to do that, it just seems impossible to get any ridership near where it would have been or should be or any of that. Yeah, I'll, I'll respond to that, um, Councilmember Marina. Absolutely, you are correct. We will not be able to reach the ridership projections we have uh, forecast without a different um, a different distancing approach. And uh, you know, right now we have um, well under a, a fraction of one percent of our trips every day that approach those capacities and provide some level of concern. And we're trying to deploy. Uh, extra coaches to meet those needs, but it's it's on the order of handfuls of buses. We do not have the capacity to, um, you know, provide that many seats uh, at that level of distancing for any kind of significant growth in the system right now. So, so it's it's those two strategies really go hand in hand. We've we've um, are underway with a a lot of additional safety strategies. There's clearly vaccinations in the community, which are a key component of all of this, but also the added filtration on the vehicles, um, you know, the, the mask requirements. There's a lot that we've put in place that will enable us to, um, to safely continue to carry higher loads as we, um, as we start to reduce those distancing requirements. Right, thank you. I'll, I'll just add one thing there, uh, council member and, and for the board members. There, you know, the current uh, guidance is six feet of distancing you're all probably very well aware uh, that within the educational system, there's been a very robust uh, process looking at what is safe distancing in the classroom and, and decisions were made to go to three feet. Um, the state's requirement for transit is three feet. Um, the preference is expressed for six feet. The health board in Snohomish County has encouraged us to stay at six feet but that's the first opportunity to really look at that question. At what point is it safe for us to go to three feet? Um, and and that, that will help us a great deal when we can do that. Um, make sure we've got enough vehicles out there on the, on the road. And then of course, as we move into phase four, um, that'll be the next opportunity to look at, at those distancing requirements. <clears throat> and it may be that as we move along that continuum, we have to continue, you know, with the masking and with the disinfecting and, and the hand washing and all of that. But there, there's a path there. And we're going to have to be very engaged with our partners to, to, to make those decisions and those changes as we go forward. All right. Any other board members want to ask any questions? Well, then I guess it's my turn. Roland, I've got a question. You did uh, answer part of my question by saying that you're talking to the major employers uh, about what their plans are uh, to try to get ahead of maybe uh, changes in the way they're doing business or when they're going to be back in business, et cetera, et cetera. What have you found out? Are, they, are there some of the major employers that are taking our computers to Seattle? Are they changing things and maybe leaving a bunch of people on work from home schedules or... Are they just planning on bringing everybody back and we need to be ready for that? Or is there some kind of a hybrid of that? What, what are you hearing from the employers? And then a second part of that question is, how are we monitoring the landscape of the movement of the major employers uh, coming out of the Seattle area and moving out to the Bellevue area and beyond and then north into Arlington and that, and that kind of thing? I'll actually, I'm, I'm going to throw this to Molly for the first part of your question, because I think Molly's staff are actually the ones that are in direct contact with a lot of our major employers. Yeah, and I don't have a list off the top of my head, but, but um, we are watching, we are listening to it. I would say employers are doing what's right for them and their workforce, and that is a variety of thing. We, we tend to think most will go back to some sort of a hybrid telework um, situation. Um, but some are also bringing them back completely. So it really depends on them. And, um, and that information is then communicated to them. 
to the second part of your question uh, regarding the major employers that are moving, you know, either moving out or moving to the region from other areas. Um, I'm, I'm particularly mindful of uh, a lot of the dramatic growth that's happening in the north part of Snohomish County uh, up in the Cascade Industrial Center with Arlington and Marysville. And that is certainly something we are closely tracking. I know um, Rick and I have been out on some community visits in recent weeks. And, you know, we've talked about uh, talked about that with, you know, with uh, um, with Lake Stevens, with you, and also with, uh, you know, we've been up in Arlington and, and, uh, um, and are going to Marysville, I know, next week. Uh, that is definitely a key part of our planning um, as we think about the next evolution of our local network. And so we've talked about when we start connecting to light rail, particularly in 2024, there's this opportunity to redeploy and redesign our services. And um, Rick has called it a mobility dividend. It's really that that opportunity to take advantage of this uh, reinvestment of capacity that used to be stuck in traffic on I-5 and put it to use inside Snohomish County. Serving those employers effectively is is one of those priorities. So just it's it's definitely on the radar. Um, we're tracking it, and uh, you know there's going to be more conversation on that, especially as we get into some of the long range planning conversations later this year. So Molly, um, a follow on question, if you don't mind. Um, so you talk to the employers about what they're doing, that's great. Is there any way that we know, I guess, how many writers or if, how many writers per employer we're talking about? Like, let's say, you know, we know that 30% of the Amazon employees from our, our area are going on our buses or or is this just a big, okay, we've got this many riders. We're not really sure where they're going except they're going down to the downtown core. Uh, is there a way to slice and dice that so you can understand what one particular or two particular employers might do to us? Um, I, I think there's opportunity within our ORCA data potentially in the RAD team and looking at uh, statistics of where buses are traveling, um, et cetera, that we could leverage that information to, together to help us with some prediction. I think things are so variable right now and so changing and people are just really starting to settle into um, what their next moves are going to be. Um, and it's definitely an area of opportunity for us to think about. Okay. Well, thank you for your answers, both of you. Nice presentation. I appreciate it. Uh, any other questions for other board members? Seeing none, I'll hand it back over to Rick and he can continue with his presentations. Thank you, sir. Um, just as we move to the next one, you know, my key takeaway from, from Molly's deck is that 68% figure of folks who aren't riding right now um, being open to coming back. and. You know that represents an opportunity and to realize that opportunity we got to be in touch with them and so that's that's our plan over the second half of the year um moving into the employee experience um want to recognize steve and, and cesar uh, to talk about the things we've done uh, internally to respond to covid uh to prepare our folks to to work effectively during covid and to get there ready uh, to come back. Um, and so without further ado, I will hand it to Steve. Good afternoon, everybody. I think as Molly has mentioned about what we need to do moving forward is what we've been focusing on from the onset back in February when the CDC issued their health and workplace directive. It was about safety. Uh, we wanted to make sure that we enacted safety measures early and aggressively to protect our employees, families, customers. We wanted to be able to respond uh, quickly to changing requirements um, and, and making sure that we had ample availability of PPE so that we could protect our employees. Early in the pandemic, in the first couple of months, it was an evolving dynamic situation. And we developed our agency response by following guidance and regulations from CDC. We coordinated and learned from other agencies. We listened to our employees. We did a lot of field engagements with uh, our coach operators and supervisors. And we adjusted our actions real time. 
overall, in the grand scheme of things, we probably initiated over 140 specific action items in response to COVID. Um, you see some of them mentioned on this slide, uh, but it was all with the thought of we wanted of wanting to protect our frontline employees in the field and at our facilities and to keep everybody as safe as possible. Suspending fares, rear door boarding, um, implementing nightly coach disinfecting, implementing safety or uh, I'm sorry, health check-in stations at the entrance of the building, which, which by the way is still in operation today. We talked about six foot distancing on coaches and you know, having to manage staffing levels on the fly uh, as the special COVID lead programs were being implemented. And as Roland pointed out, service levels were reduced by 25% on the, at the end of March, the first of several changes in service levels over the course of the past year. Next slide, Rachel. And again, in mid-April, we reduced service levels an additional 10%. And as the event unfolded and time went on, multiple operational changes were implemented. Social distancing measures in our common areas, traffic flows, break rooms, um, you know, placing floor decals, all to educate, remind employees about keeping socially distanced, uh, washing hands, um, we made changes on base, sign-in terminals. Uh, we we uh, procured and installed hand-free faucets, um, touchless soap and towel dispensers, and you know we we went room by room and and uh, implemented room capacity limits. We also we also communicated uh, an enormous amount with customers and employees to keep them updated on the many changes in policies and, and in operations. Next slide. And as, and as the pandemic progressed, we continued to refine our safety measures and responses. Face shields were distributed to employees. We had several drivers that tested a variety of, of face shields and we offered coach operators uh, options to select from. We resumed swift fare collection in June, followed by non-swift coaches in July. Um, we had, unfortunately, to uh, lay off and furlough um, people. Uh, that happened during this time, and Cesar will cover this in, in more detail shortly. We installed temperature safety check stations. Um, we posted additional signage for health and safety throughout our facilities and throughout our coaches. We, we installed air filters, enhanced air filters, MERV 7 and 8s on board coaches. And as of February 2021, we required our field and uh, maintenance folks to wear KN95 masks. So in addition to our focus on safety, we're, we're of course additionally focused on making sure we have vac vaccines available and accessible. And Cesar will talk more about this in a minute, but this is a real game changer for us uh, and for our essential workers. We, we pride ourselves as an organization in having an ethic of continuous improvement. And it was very evident during this event. We learned a lot. We had many successes and best practices that we'll be carrying forward. Um, you know, Roland and uh, Molly mentioned a couple. Um, you know, from an operations perspective, we, you know, we plan on carrying out or continuing to use uh, standby vehicles in, our, in the field so that we can provide uh, good service. Uh, we're gonna continue to, to engage with our, with our employees in the field from a management perspective. So there's a couple of things that I think that we really learned from and we're going to continue to, to, uh, to do moving forward. Uh, in addition, our focus is going to continue to be on safety as we continue to follow all public health guidance. We are evaluating other safety enhancements as we speak. Um, 
but as we look forward to um, service expansion, we have to continue to recruit and train new coach operators to support those increase in service levels. Um, you know, we have to get our service back to normal, which means probably opening up our front doors on swift coaches um, and uh, making sure that as we move forward that we have uh, great service with little disruption. And at this time, I'll turn it over to Cesar. He can talk more about the employee experience and what we're doing to support our employees. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, good to see everyone. I recognize that we are running out of time, so I will uh, move swiftly through these presentations. Uh, I don't want to minimize the experience of the employee. So uh, our employees who are out there listening to this, it's not to minimize what we've been going through, but I do recognize that the board has received, excuse me, this information in various forms. So to, for a great, to a great extent, this is a repetition of much of what we've already presented. So um, we were first to send employees home when the uh, epidemic started. Um, many of our employees, uh, a great number of our employees remain on base because of their essential services, coach operators, mechanics, maintenance, service ambassadors, et, et cetera. There was a small number of employees who worked uh, from home exclusively uh, and some who worked both uh, at home and here who had a form of hybrid schedule to ensure that we continue to deliver service to our essential workers who were on base and to other customers. We were um, we created uh, a lot of sessions to support our employees when we knew that uh, schools were closing and that uh, schools were going to reopen. We we held sessions to support our employees to help them figure out how can we how can we as an employer help them and how can they help each other and to come up with creative solutions. We also had various sessions with managers to determine what challenges they saw within their work groups. So um, we also surveyed our employees to learn more of what we could do to to support them. Uh, other things that we included were um, technology. Uh, this was really a, a cross-departmental effort. It was uh, technology, certainly, and, and communications. So we provided additional laptops, uh, mobile phones, uh, set up uh, call centers uh, to operate remotely, and even held uh, a virtual employee recognition, recognition Zoom, as you can see on, on the picture here. Next uh, slide, please. Um, one of the um, things that I also wanted to do was do a, a shout out to our employees who have gone through so much uh, and also to the unions. The unions have been really phenomenal partners uh, through this process. Uh, I'm very happy to say that, uh, that we met uh, by phone daily with ATU at the, out, at the start of this uh, epidemic and then started to taper off uh, based on once we had a really good understanding of our response and have continued to communicate with them extensively, they were really good partners in ensuring that we communicated with our employees um, and, and strategize on how we could each do our part in, in ensuring that, that our, our employees got the information they needed. Many uh, federal initiatives came out, as you all know. Governor also issued many directives. And then now with the vaccinations that were made available, we also engaged uh, with our employees and the unions in communicating uh, what we were providing to our employees, which included supporting them, having uh, laptops available up here uh, on this floor so that those who had uh, difficulty with um, logging on and, and scheduling appointments could come and receive the support from both uh, training and from employee engagement. Next slide, please. So as was referenced, and as you've heard before, we had uh, voluntary separations, which were very successful. These were individuals who were ready to retire or close to retirement or individuals who were reconsidering uh, their career and making life changes such as moving out of the area. Uh, we also uh, took other steps uh, and uh, including freezing uh, a hiring freeze, which helped uh, mitigate some of the challenges that we were facing early on during the epidemic. Next slide. Um, was mentioned, we've mentioned the employee case count and this uh, mimics the, uh, the experience of the county. 
uh, Rick mentioned that we recently had two positives in April. We were very happy that we had gone quite a few weeks without any positives, but um, oh, this is very much similar to what the, the county is experiencing. Uh, again, vaccinations are available and we uh, are continuing to communicate with our employees uh, of this and we are supporting them as much as possible wherever we can. Next slide. We made quite a few changes in our policies. Um, the, we were, um, the, the premium pay, for example, was one that was very, um, what we were one of a few agencies that created, that provided a premium pay to our employees. We were one of four that responded in the affirmative uh, at, at a national uh, survey. Next slide. What are we going to do uh, going forward? We've mentioned to our employees that we will return to base on a phased approach or tiered approach. We have approximately three quarters of our employees who are working on base. Uh, many of them or some of them are administrative employees or employees who work in an office. The first group that will come back will be those that are vaccinated and those that are ready and able to return. And the second group would be those who need time to make arrangements. And then the third group would be those that have some vulnerable medical conditions that need a little bit more uh, support. Next slide. So what does the future look like for us? We've also talked along with discussing the return to base uh, approach. We've also talked about what future the future of our workforce will look like, primarily telework. Many employers, have, as you have heard, have struggled with returning employees back to base, but also with telework. And what will that look like for employers? Within our own region, you have a variety of approaches that, that have been uh, reported in the news. One area that we have focused on is the uh, demographics of our employee population. As you can see here, uh, we have uh, an aging group that will be soon retiring. I am very proud to say that I am one of the boomers who will be leaving sometime in the future. But we need to create an, um, uh, an employer that really is, uh, that is an employer that we want to continue to be an employer of choice. So this is one of the things that has been driving us. How can we continue to be an employer of, uh, of choice, recognizing that we have different generations coming behind us? And we have engaged uh, a consultant who has a national reputation at working directly with employers on developing uh, telework programs specific to their needs. Um, so that next slide, please. Uh, well, that, that completes my presentation. I would uh, refer, I'm open to any questions and uh, would hand it over to the chair, Chair Daughtry. Okay, thank you, Cesar and Steve. We appreciate your presentation. Does anybody have any? Oh, Jen, you have a question. Yeah, a real quick one. Um, <clears throat> does community transit require the employees who have direct contact with our customers to be vaccinated before they come back to work? No, we have not required a vaccination. Uh, I'm not aware of, um, well, no, we're, we're not requiring it to answer your question directly. Is that, Rick, is that something we're going to look at? I mean, um, I, I personally would not want to be on a bus that the coach operator would not be vaccinated. Well, it's uh, complicated. It won't surprise you to hear that it's complicated. Right now we are strongly encouraging employees to get vaccinated and strongly encouraging employees to let us know when they've been vaccinated um we can do a little more research on that topic and engage more with you um but you know there are folks who have health issues related to vaccinations and, and there are there are other complicating factors we need to to be mindful of as we think about what the policy is uh, relative to vaccination but what we're seeing is folks are 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 motivated uh, to get vaccinated and and you know, they're continuing to engage with us uh, in moving along that continuum. Okay, thank you. That's gonna remain a concern of mine for some time. 
Other questions? Anybody else? Um, yes, I had one. Go ahead, Tom. Um, did we set up any sort of a contact tracing program for coach operators and um, also for uh, ridership? We set up a contact tracing program for all our employees who reported that they uh, were positive. Uh, and we developed a very strong relationship with the um, county health department. We work with them very, very closely. Uh, as soon as we learn of a positive case, we are in communication with them and we do our own contact tracing here for employees. The county does their own contact tracing for other relationships. So we collabor collaborate extensively. And uh, I can say that it's been a very, very positive experience for us. Um, and uh, so to answer your question, yes, we have, and we continue to do so and work closely with, uh, with the county. Thank you. All right, any other questions? Thank you, Tom and uh, Jan for your questions. And thank you, Cesar and Ken, uh, Steve, <laughs> Mr. Kim. It's hard, to, it's hard not to call you Kim when my name's Kim. So it's, uh, I still have to get that wrapped around my head. But thank you, Steve and Cesar for your presentations. And I'll hand it back over to Rick for the next presentation. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, so we've, along with uh, ridership, and customer and employee information. We've been updating you regularly on the performance of our finances over the course of this uh, last year. Um, we made a series of adjustments with the board last year uh, to our revenue forecast and to our budget. And, uh, you know, we, we took some very prudent steps and those steps served us well. I think we're finding now, uh, 12 months later, uh, that those actions we took protected the agency and positioned us well uh, for a period of growth coming out of the pandemic. And, you know, I want Jerry to talk about that. Uh, we've also been benefiting from a sustained level of investment in transit by the federal government. So between the financial assistance we're seeing there and uh, how well our um, uh, corrective measures uh, performed based on last spring's actions, uh, we're in a fairly robust financial position. And I, I want to flag this for the board because it means we have some opportunities going forward um, to think creatively about how we want to lean into innovation and lean into our capital program um, going forward. Uh, it's a sort of, we're experiencing a moment here where we've got uh, fairly significant one-time opportunity. So keep that uh, general thought in mind as you listen to the presentation, um, because this is sort of the opening gun for the uh, 2022 budget process today. Uh, we'll be talking about this and these themes uh, over the course of the year as we work through, through those important processes. So with that, I'll turn it over to, to Jerry and, and later to Roland to, to, to give the report. Great, thank you, Rick. Uh, good afternoon, board members. Um, we had a finance committee meeting this, this afternoon, actually, so I uh, got a little baby preview of, of that for finance committee of what the budget cycle looks like. So um, I won't go into a lot of detail on this slide, but basically wanted to remind you that it, we responded very quickly in, in 2020. Um, you, you were aware of the steps we were taking. We were briefing you monthly. I put the um, the graph in there just as a reminder that we moved pretty quickly to re-projecting our sales tax revenue uh, with the guardrails of the rapid recovery and slow recovery. When we built our 2021 budget, we used that slow recovery scenario. A um, lot, lot of uncertainty uh, last year, a little bit less uncertainty now, but um, we, you know, we definitely knew there was going to be some sort of a change in 2020. Next slide, Rachel. So how did it all work out? Um, when we ended 2020, we had reduced our expenditures by uh, almost 9%. Um, that includes uh, the fact that we accommodated the increases in uh, costs related to COVID-19 response. So um, really held ourselves to uh, a lower expenditure. 
Um, our sales tax revenue came in at about what it was originally budgeted at, despite our um, you know, projection of the slow recovery. So we did very well in terms of the actual sales tax revenue. And I know that uh, many of your jurisdictions experienced the same thing. And then the Federal Recovery Act, you know that we got $39 million of CARES Act funding. Roland will talk about the other recovery funds coming in. But in 2020, that was the kind of the first opportunity to see that um, revenue coming in and to use it for operating needs and some capital needs. We built the 2021 budget based on that slow recovery scenario. So um, what you see, if you look at the upper right in that chart is that our budget for 2021 started out at about 130 million for operating expenses, pretty much exactly where we were ending 2020. Um, but now we've had uh, four months of actual, so we're in the middle of updating our projections, both for sales tax and other revenue. Um, we will come to you this year with two things. One is a mid-year 2021 budget amendment to reflect some of those actuals that have come in and also to um, reflect some projects that we did not anticipate at the time we built the budget. And then we, of course, are also building our 2022 budget and that will come to you a little bit later this year, but um, we'll have, have some additional, uh, you know, I guess buckets that Roland's gonna talk about here in just a minute. So I'm actually, Roland, I'm gonna turn it over to you to talk about those buckets. Okay, thanks, Jerry. Um, so as Jerry talked about, you know, we're, we're underway with a lot of modeling activity right now uh, relating to these revised revenue forecasts um, and, our, and our revised expense uh, profile. Um, that's related to, to both the sales tax and also the federal relief funding. Um, the focus right now is really making the most of this unique moment that Rick was describing in terms of we've, we've got um, this opportunity to, to make some one-time choices um, and, and really make some unique progress on, uh, on some major initiatives. And yet at the same time, we really need to keep a focus on what the, the long-term sustainability of our system will be in terms of uh, you know, the, 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 the transportation needs in the communities we serve. Growth is going to continue and um, need for greater service levels in the future will continue. And we just wanna make sure that uh, we are able to keep the eye on the ball in terms of long-term service sustainability at the same time that we're addressing how to use this unique one-time funding opportunity. So it's that dual focus, and uh, you'll be hearing a lot more about that in the coming months as we get into the, the TDP and budget updates. So next slide. So Jerry mentioned the, the federal relief, relief funding, and I won't dwell a long time here, but you know the important point here is the magnitude of the opportunity. Um, we, we received 39 million last year in CARES Act funding. Uh, these are preliminary estimates on the, the CRISA and the American Recovery Plan numbers. Um, so you know, we, we don't know exactly what these numbers will be, but they're, they're probably the right order of magnitude. And when you look at the combination of all three of these sources, um, you know, we're, we're at $129 million in this current estimate. So it really is a, um, a, a unique opportunity. We can make some significant progress on, uh, on some of these initiatives for, our, um, for, for the future. And I'll talk in a second about what some of those are. Um, also, just to say that we are tracking the uh, congressional requests for infrastructure needs uh, in terms of what's coming out of the Biden administration and Congress for uh, transportation infrastructure. And so that's yet another potential source um, of funding for, uh, for capital and other initiatives. Um, and we're, we're fully engaged in that process as well. Next slide. So uh, in terms of this, this one time or this, this really unique moment or opportunity that we have, we are really beginning to focus in four primary areas. And you can see those here um, in terms of uh, strengthening our operating reserves, uh, some opportunities for innovation, uh, ongoing service improvement, and then a, a more robust capital program. Um, and you know some examples of, of conceptual lists that are in these areas um, is you know continued build out of the SWIFT network, uh, things like restoring our fuel reserve and, and enlarging the size of our operating reserve to be more resilient um, in the you know potential future economic downturns and providing for service resilience. Uh, we're going to hear in just a few minutes from June on uh, zero emission, and that is a, a significant future initiative that doesn't have a, a known price tag yet, but we know that it's going to be significant. We have an opportunity to make some progress uh, given this current situation. 
also completing the facility master plan. And we've recently shared you know, some of the more uh, recent phases of that that, uh, that are coming online. Uh, things like bus stop improvements and also beginning to um, reserve further, further ahead for things like uh, technology replacement and uh, technology preservation in the same way that we do for facilities. So as I said, we'll, we'll be hearing more about that um, in, the, in the coming weeks and months. Um, we're looking at uh, you know, solutions that are scalable to different costs and funding levels and also some things that are more near term and some things that are longer term. So more to come. Um, that completes our portion of the presentation and I'm gonna turn it back to the chair and Jerry and I would be happy to answer questions. Okay, any question? I have hundreds of questions somewhere around the same amount of money we just got. So we're getting any questions from the rest of the board. I guess not. Shan, are you sure? Okay. Um, yeah. <laughs> I think we're going finance. to, yeah, I think that, uh, I think it's going to be interesting uh, to watch how we go forward with this. And I know the board is, board is going to be ready and willing to make some impressive decisions coming up on what's going on. Uh, I'm very interested in some of the things that Roland had to say about where the money could go. Uh, I've had some conversations with Rick about it also, and uh, I'm getting kind of excited about what this could mean for community transit, but not only community transit, but for our community. Uh, usually when we speak of community transit, we are really talking about the community. So. Uh, I think it's going to be pretty cool. Go ahead, Joe. Thank you, Chair. Uh, I just, you know, I guess I'd be remiss if I didn't take this opportunity to bring up and to ask uh, if there's any interest or uh, certainly from the chair that uh, I know we missed, we missed the bus a few years ago on the uh, Muckleteo Park and Ride lot. And uh, that's just one of the reasons I got back on the bus uh, to make sure if we can not miss it again. Uh, and uh, anyway, well, so I, just I thought I'd throw that out there. So I can tell you, I can tell you, Joe, that uh, seeing how you and I have been on the board a long time together, and this this keeps coming up, I did a little bit of research into some of the funds that we're going to be getting from the feds, and uh, they specifically said that we could not use it for the Muckleteo Park and Ride. So uh, I think we're out of luck there. No, nothing south of Everett, it said. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. So anyway, just so it's not a surprise as if I keep talking about it. No, and we and really, uh, that's exactly what we think we have to have the discussions around is what is actually needed in the different communities in Snohomish County. So no, it's obviously not on the ta off the table, and we do need to talk about it. And it may be that uh, we could do that, and it may be that we need to go a different direction. But those are the kinds of things that the staff is looking at. I'm sure. Uh, I know that they understand uh, the, the Muckleteo Park and Ride. Everybody, you know, we've been talking about it for years, right, Roland? <laughs> and uh, is, he, is, is Emmett still on the line? Yeah, Emmett, Emmett's still on the line. So he's kind of chuckling probably. But um, uh, those and other things uh, are coming. And so we really need to have a, a robust conversation on the board about the direction uh, that we're gonna go for the future. And I, the future is looking bright at this moment and we'll we'll see what happens but uh yeah joe thanks for bringing it back up yeah, again because it, it's necessary thank you chair Dutcher. anybody else any questions for the last presentation or anything else all right rick i'll change it i'll, I'll uh, give it back to you again thanks mr chair and, and thanks council member marine uh there's something complimentary to be said about consistency, but I'm not quite sure what it is, so I won't say it. Um, I, you know, for us, I think step one, as Roland alluded to, is to establish some strategic reserves to, to pursue these theme areas, and, and, and then second, to do the planning work necessary to program those reserves. And so, you know, in many ways, uh, it's a good segue to our next topic. Um, but, before we leave this topic, you know, I, I think it's important to recognize that we have this opportunity um, that, you know, we're looking at this, not just in the context of where we sit today, uh, but in the context of where we're gonna be three years from now. 
uh, when there's four more light rail stations open, um, two of which are in Snohomish County and Montlake Terrace and Linwood. Uh, for decades, we've spent uh, a significant uh, portion of our resources serving that downtown and University of Washington commuter market. 30% uh, of our service is in and out of downtown. And the light rail system was planned and is being built uh, to provide that service and deliver that load and, and to make it a better commute experience than one experiences on I-5. And I, I'm predicting, you know, and maybe I'm a little biased here, but I think they're gonna hit that mark. And, and that gives us this immense uh, moment of opportunity uh, to relook at our model. Uh, and, and how we provide for mobility within the county. And so it may mean looking at, at further expansion of SWIFT. It may mean looking at more innovative services like we're exploring now with the Linwood Pilot and, and looking at how those types of services could be scaled in other communities. Um, you know, we're gonna continue to pro provide robust fixed route service no matter what, I'm convinced of that. The question is gonna be how do we evolve in addition to that? And it may be that our system does look different uh, in, in five, 10 years than it looks today. And that would be good because it would mean we're responding to how our county is changing. So that's probably enough philosophy uh, for now. Um, thank you for the discussion and, and for the questions uh, on these topics. It's been a year, uh, but we're excited about the future and uh, we're excited about climbing out of this pandemic. And what better way to uh, imagine the future uh, than to talk about our, uh, our next topic, which is uh, the study that we propose to do uh, of zero emission technology. Um, there's been a lot of chatter in the community. There's been a lot of experimentation within the transit in industry uh, with zero emission vehicles. Um, it is clear uh, from what we're seeing at the federal level and in Olympia that our state and federal partners are preparing uh, to continue to robustly incentivize you know, the procurement and use of zero emission vehicles. Um, so what I would like to propose is that we uh, take a deep dive over the next year, year and a half into the state of techno the technology uh, and to really look at what's available and how it's performing uh, and what's required to take advantage of this technology, what's required to be able to sustain it, uh, how that might affect us long-term uh, financially from a mobility perspective, uh, to really look at what the options are uh, for community transit to take advantage of the evolving technology uh, within the transit vehicle uh, manufacturing and design industry. So, um, that's what we propose to do, is to do a study and bring back a, um, a deep trove of data and, and other information uh, from our friends and partners throughout the industry, from academia, from the manufacturers, from the nonprofit community that's interested in this stuff. Uh, I think the timing couldn't be better uh, because of the policy framework that, that we're operating in right now. Um, and the fact that uh, the, the agency has stayed in a watchful waiting period to see how this technology can play out in other communities, uh, to take a discerning look uh, and to be deliberate about what's best for community transit. So that's where we are and we're proposing to move into a more active look. And so what I'm gonna do now is introduce June Duvall and she's gonna talk with you a little bit about how we're proposing to conduct this analysis and uh, how it will come back to the board uh, next year. June? Next slide, please. Good, good afternoon, board members. Um, I'm gonna recognize that uh, we're getting a little late in the, in the meeting and try to go as fast as I can through this in order to leave time for questions. So the real goal of the study is to get better educated on what could work best for us we really see this as a participatory study. So a consultant will help us all learn the pros and cons of technologies, the costs, the expectations, so that we can decide on what the final conclusion is. This is not a study where we're gonna hire someone to, to look at us and, and deliver us their opinion. This is something to work us all through what that would look like. 
And we expect to take about 18 months, starting with an RFP in July. Next slide, please. So we need to know more about what's available, how things work, what are the risks and benefits, what can the market bear? The scan, a scan of the industry to learn about what our options are. So that's gonna be a, a pretty big part of this study. Next slide, please. A big consideration is obviously the overall cost to the agency, both capital and operating. For capital and infrastructure, there's the cost of the bus, but also the fueling or charging and the size and space needs. We know through, from the facility master plan that space is at a premium. So that has to be a consideration. What are the life cycle costs and what do we need to do for redundant systems? As Rick mentioned earlier, this is a legacy system. So what would we expect that this is going to look like in the future? Next slide, please. We want to analyze how the technologies perform, specifically how they would perform in our unique environment, our risks and benefits, and what would we do with utilities? What would it all take to make this work? Next slide, please. A big component is change management um, by converting to zero technology, uh, zero emission technologies. There'll be a lot of changes for us as an agency. And so how does this change our future from planning and training to ops and maintenance? What are those changes that we can expect? Next slide, please. Probably one of the most important aspects of this study is the engagement element. We want to work with the board, the executive leadership team and staff to engage in meaningful dialogue, to see where the data leads us, to learn, and to have more thoughtful discussions about what community transit looks like in the future. Next slide, please. So staff will bring the board options and our judgment of the pros and cons of each of them. We don't have a bias going in as to what the conclusion will be. We're performing due diligence and trying to follow the data to, to make a very informed decision. Next slide, please. I told you I'd try to go really fast, I'm sorry. Um, as mentioned, the consultants will help us determine what our best options could be for our service. Next slide. A quick scan and words of wisdom from other agencies out there. Um, they really, they're saying it starts with a detailed study to fully understand and chart where we want to go. And so that's what we're looking to do. Next slide, please. The study is going to give us information for future decisions. These decisions will be in a next phase, but this is the first step on a path towards a converting to a zero emission technology. And with that, I'll turn it over to Chair Daughtry and happy to answer any questions. Okay, well, that was uh, a lengthy discussion. Holy cow. Thanks, June. You did really well. Um, so that's a good uh, kind of an appetizer for the zero emissions uh, conversation we're going to be having in the future. Does anybody have any questions for June right now? Jan. Go ahead. Uh, mine isn't so much a question as it is uh, a request. Uh, I was on the growth management board for six years through Vision 2050. And in Vision 2050, um, we addressed electrification, we addressed uh, charging stations, transportation. And I would really encourage you because that's what the cities in the four counties are going to have to abide by and maybe look at that and see if there's things that we can also incorporate into our plan as we start looking at that. Thank you. Mr. Norton. Yeah, thank you, Kim. I was uh, sitting here thinking that there are, I'm sure, within APTA, many agencies that are uh, have tried this or are, are using um, zero emissions fleets, different sizes and stuff. Have we considered, uh, you know, the resource of APTA to find out prior to hiring a consultant what information we can go and then go forward with? What, what do you think? So there's, there is a growing um, wealth of information out there. Uh, TRB, the Transportation Research Board, has recently put out a new report just in February of this year. 
Um, it's TRP at TCRP report 219. I have a copy of it. But really what APTA and the APTA bus standards is recommending is that you start with a detailed study. Um, one of the quotes on that previous slide was, APTA really encourage don't do what others are doing without looking first to see if it would really work for your, um, for your environment. So um, that's, you know, APTA examples, APTA technology, all of that absolutely being reviewed and, and considered. But we are also looking at their, their advice to look at it in our individual environment. I see. Okay, well, thank you for that. Mm -hmm. Joe, did you have a question? Yeah, no, I just wanted to say I, I was glad to see that hydrogen fuel cell was still in the mix there. I know that, you know, for electricity in our area, that may end up winning out just because we have uh, less expensive electricity and most of ours comes from a very clean source, as that's not necessarily true in other parts of the country. Uh, of course, the downside is uh, we just have literally no infrastructure with regard to the fueling for hydrogen fuel cell. But I'm glad to see it's still out there in the mix. I think it's a it's a cleaner form. And um, what also I don't know, well, there's a whole lot. I could go on about what I don't know. But in particular, uh, you know, there's there's fewer breakdown components on electricity, certainly over, uh, you know, diesel. But I, I really don't know fuel cell, how the internal workings of that, if it's also uh, less of an issue like electricity is, which is nice. So it, it, anyway, I'm looking forward to see the comparison and what works best for us. Hey, right, thank you, Joe. Anybody else have any questions? Tom, did you have a question? Um, I just had an observation on this as a question. Um, I find this, um, move into doing this kind of research exciting and a great opportunity for community transit. And I think um, a, um, an advisor, a consultant will help us lead into alliances that maybe we wouldn't think of, technologies that we may not think of, uh, university studies that, that are going on that we might not think of. So I think it's going to be a very exciting time and absolutely necessary to the future health of community transit. Thank, Thank you, you, Tom. Anybody else? Sid? Yeah, I would just say that, uh, you know, facts drive good decisions. And the more data that we can get, I think the better we are. So I'm all for that. It sounds like a, a good place to start. Anybody else? All right. Uh, seeing none, I'll, uh, let's see where are we at. To look at my thing. Oh, now I guess we're done with your presentations then. Is that right, Rick? Yes. Uh, uh, June gets extra points for catching us up on schedule. I, I think she recognizes the, the value of board members' time. So um, oh. she caught us up to uh, five o'clock. Uh, you know, so that concludes the staff part of the presentation. Um, I just want to thank the board again. Uh, for your leadership um, through this pandemic. Uh, we spent the last two hours talking about, you know, how the agency has fared uh, during the pandemic um, under Emmett's leadership last year and into this year. Uh, it's certainly been a trial by fire for me coming into the middle of it, uh, the holiday spike. Um, and, you know, you've been so supportive and uh, steadfast and obviously taking steps in your own jurisdictions uh, to respond to it. Uh, but on the behalf of the staff, I just want to thank you for that um, and uh, hanging in there with us. I think, uh, as you said a few minutes ago, Kim, the future is bright. We've got some opportunities in front of us, and uh, we're, we're coming through this in a position to, to take advantage of them. So, and that's a testament to, to all of your leadership, um, uh, John, last year as well. So thank you. Well, thank you. Um, so we'll move on to the chair's report. I'm going to make it really short. I don't have a chair's report today. Um, then board communications, anybody have anything they want to discuss or tell the board or seeing none, I think everybody's feeling the five o'clock approaching in 35 seconds. Um, so we have no executive session. Is there any other business for the good of the order? Seeing none, I would call this adjourned at Thank you guys. Five o'clock. Good job.
care. <laughs> it wasn't me. <laughs> <laughs> All right. 